Revelation chapter 3. It's the last book of the Bible. You know that, Jack? <laughs> Revelation chapter 3. And when you can, also open to Isaiah chapter 11. Sort of hold your finger there and have that ready because we will be referencing that as well in this morning's passage. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Jesus is speaking and says, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let us pray together. Lord, as we approach your word this morning with a letter to Sardis, Lord, we ask right now, Lord, that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, Lord, a softened heart to receive your truth, Lord. But Lord, we just ask right now that as we are going through this passage this morning, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would continue to search our hearts. Lord, that you would bring all things uh, up, to, uh, up to the surface within our own uh, hearts and mind, Lord, in the, in the quiet of our hearts, Lord. I ask that you would do a work within all of us here. So, Lord, I surrender to you as a vessel uh, of yours. Lord, I pray that you would bring forth the understanding, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning we come to the fifth church out of the seven churches that Jesus writes to, and it's the church at Sardis. Now, commentaries had commonly labeled this church as the dead church, mainly because Jesus himself declared them to be dead. So he kind of makes it easy for us by telling us what their condition was. The interesting side, though, about Sardis was that back in its day of greatness, this city was a powerful and wealthy city that was situated at, at a junction of several important roads and trade routes running through Sardis. So it was kind of like Nashville. You know, Nashville is at that center point in uh, Middle Tennessee, right, where all the important roads run through that city. And because of this, um, Sardis, they capitalized on it. As a matter of fact, in the 6th century B.C., Sardis was known as one of the greatest cities in the world. However, by the time that Jesus writes this letter to the church at Sardis, the city was nothing more than a shell of its former self. The city itself sort of lived off its former greatness, but was no longer operating like it was. And it seems that even the church at Sardis had the same kind of mindset. All right, Jesus mentions to the church uh, that they have called themselves a name that you are alive. And that's how the church assessed themselves, as, as being alive. In their minds, everything seemed alive and good. But we will see in this letter that Jesus declared them to be dead. Now, the Greek word Jesus uses for dead is nekros, meaning a body or like a corpse where it, or without the spirit. And when Jesus uses this word, it is not a church that is slowly dying. It's not that, but a church that is dead. There's no spirit. There's no life in that body. 
Jesus declared them to be dead. Now, when you think of a dead church, what comes to your mind? You may think, well, maybe it's a church that has been around for decades, you know, where there's about a third of the congregation left, and they're, they're the, a group of older saints there who live on the memory of all that God had did in their glory days. That may be one way to look at it. Or maybe you might be tempted to think it is a mainstream, liberal de denomination kind of church that is struggling, trying to keep its doors open. But when I look at the text here, for me, I find it hard to believe that any of these two descriptions could describe the church at Sardis. Because first, for us, there's too much distance between us and those two descriptions and, uh, of these churches. Because we are a new church. You know, we've only been, uh, we'll be hitting three years this coming January uh, 8th. So we're not in our glory days. And the other description is pretty obvious. We're nowhere near being like a liberal denomination or anything like that. So there's this kind of great distance from us and those two descriptions of a dying church. So it's safe to say we're not the only church in that position as well. But therefore, I believe it cannot be those descriptions that Jesus is dealing with here. Because remember, these letters are all, right, for all the churches and individual Christians to hear what the Spirit is saying in the present, as, it, as it's saying. And as we read these two descriptions of what we may think the church is, uh, or a dead church is, it doesn't fit the description Jesus gives of this church. Because those two descriptions of churches would not have the reputation of naming themselves alive. A dead church, you, know, you go to a church that's very, they're, they're not going to sit there and have that reputation of being alive when they know they're dead. And everyone else knows it too that's around them. Oh, that church is, you know, they're, they're kind of slowly fading out, you know. They would not even try to give the illusion that they're still alive at all. But if you notice real quick in verse 1, Jesus gives us a description of the church. He says, I know your works. And the word works in Greek is ergon, where we get our English word energy, meaning they labored, they toiled, they were constantly active. They were an energetic church where their energy was going in all directions nonstop. So the word Aragon describes a working church. So based off this truth, we can picture the church uh, in Sardis as an energetic church, right? With a reputation of being a church that is alive. Everything is organized. Coffee is made. Signs and banners are out. Cones are out there ready for parking, right? Bulletins are printed. Everyone's in place. Parking attendants, greeters, the ushers, the children's ministry, the youth ministry, the, the hospitality. I mean, all things are in place and are ready to go in this church. And the service, all in order, right? The worship team's well rehearsed. The announcement's ready. The media tech ready. And the Bible teaching ready. Everything is good to go. And outwardly, by appearance, they give us a picture of a healthy spiritual church. They saw themselves as alive and well. And to even question this church, you know, are you guys alive? It would be in front of them. I mean, take a look for yourself. They'd be, of course we're alive. Ask anyone in the community. They will tell you that this church is very much alive. Yet when Jesus looks at them and assesses that church, he declares to that church, but you are dead. I mean, talk about a complete contrast to what they were thinking. And the thing is, Jesus is the truth. And what he declares is what we call clarity and the absolute truth. And so here you have this gap that exists between the church's assessment of themselves and Jesus' assessment of that church. And no one within the church at Sardis, let alone within that community, would have ever guessed that this church was dead. And do you know what that tells us, Christians? <laughs> that dead churches are not as easy to identify as we would think. It gave the appearance that it was very much alive, yet it was dead. And this is what we are dealing with this morning with the church at Sardis. And so Je Jesus begins in verse 1. He says, And to the angels of the church in Sardis write, 
And so Jesus is writing this letter to the pastor or the leader of the church at Sardis. And then I want you guys to pay very close attention because it is by his description of himself that Jesus reveals the cause of their dead condition. Because like all the other letters, Jesus gives a self-description from the revelation of his glory given in chapter 1, reminding them of something that the church has forgotten or has lost sight of about him and his character. He says to the church and each Christian individually, he says, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And I think the Amplified Bible's translation explains this verse for us pretty clearly. How many of us like the Amplified Bible? I love it. It's a great resource. But it gives us some more clarity. It says, These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God, the sevenfold Holy Spirit, and the seven stars. That's important. Now, if you remember back in chapter 1, in, of Revelation, the Holy Spirit in verse 4 is referred to as the seven spirits before his throne. So this is not the first time we're hearing about this. The seven spirits is a clear reference to the Holy Spirit because in verses 4 and 5 through chapter 1, we have the reference to the Father. We have the reference to the Holy Spirit as the seven spirits. And then we have the reference to the Son, all three persons of the Godhead described together. Now, remember I told you as we were approaching this, in order for us to understand the book of Revelation, we need to have a, a, the key to understanding it is having an understanding of the Old Testament. Okay? And so uh, the, the Old Testament, it gives us a, a, a nice, clear image, you know, of the description of the, like seven spirits or so. So where do we find the sevenfold description of the Holy Spirit? It's found in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 2 which in context is the anointing of the Holy Spirit that would be put upon the Messiah in his incarnation. So turn with me to, to Isaiah chapter 11, and we're going to look at uh, verses 1 and 2. Now Isaiah says, There shall come from a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Speaking of Jesus. He said, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So as Jesus describes himself in the Revelation, the church in Sardis had lost sight of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life and in the ministry of the Lord. There were a church that was no longer operating under the control of the Holy Spirit. They were no longer dependent on the leading of the Holy Spirit. So all that great energy that is put in the church while, where everything is just seems perfectly organized and all things seems to be spot on and well rehearsed is not always a sign of a healthy church. I mean, it can be, but not always. And here's what I mean. Well, I don't want to be too graphic here, but uh, has anyone ever witnessed the old saying, uh, a chicken with his head cut off? Have you, has anybody seen that? So when the chicken, when its head is cut off, we see the word aragon, that Greek word for works that Jesus uses. You see aragon in full action. When the chicken's head is cut off, you see something that's not healthy. It reveals that the body has separated from the head, right? It's almost as if the body doesn't realize it has been separated, but knows something has terribly gone wrong and responds in this high energy. Now, we, you know what I'm talking about. I don't have to describe it or act it out for you, right? Okay. So, <laughs> so this is what happened with the church. The body was cut off from the head, who is Jesus Christ not knowing that they have left their dependence of the Holy Spirit. And what ends up happening, typically, is that the pastor or the leader will manifest a separation from the head in the same exact way as the chicken's body did, where apart from the head, they raise the level of activity because they sense something's not right, something's wrong, you know. So they raise the activity by generating more activity, maybe developing more ministries, 
oh, we need a program for this and that, you know, more programs, you know, adding more dynamics to the service. You know what, let's, let's bring more lights into there. That way, you know, we can control the environment with just pure, you know, flashing lights, you know, but not too much, you know. And, uh, you know, let's, let's, let's go ahead, let's, let's work on you, Pastor, on how you deliver it, you know. Let, maybe some more shouting and, and more energy and then bring it back down to something a little bit calm and, and just land your sermon perfectly, you know, down the, the runway, you know, speak with passion. But, you know, when you're landing that, that sermon down, make sure your keyboard player's ready to go so he can just kind of build up the whole feeling of it all, right? You know, and we do all those things. They do all those things in order to give them life that they don't have by the Holy Spirit. And yet they continue to raise the level of activity and energy higher and higher and higher. But just like we see with the body of the chicken separated from its head, the church can only mask itself of its problem only for a time. Because if the problem is not recognized... It's only a matter of time before that church, ultimately, it dies. And what I mean about if the problem is not recognized, I'm talking about those few people within the congregation who sense something is wrong, that in the midst of all this high activity, they sense that there's no Holy Spirit involved in the work. They sense that there's no witness to the Holy Spirit of all that they were doing and all that they were saying. And if, if they don't recognize this, if there's not that person there, again, it's only a matter of time before the church ultimately dies. Now, if you look back to Isaiah chapter 11, the description that is given of the Holy Spirit is one that only the Holy Spirit and he alone can supply to a Christian's life. And he alone can supply to a Christian church and its leadership. And again, in context, this is the anointing right, of the Holy Spirit upon the Messiah, which is Jesus in his carnation. And what better life to look at and see the fruit of the Spirit than Jesus' life, and, or the fruit of his public ministry than Jesus' ministry, right? And what I love about the description of the Holy Spirit in Isaiah is that it gives us like a broader picture of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Notice in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Lord. He's Yahweh. He's God. And what it, this is saying is that the Holy Spirit, as God, is deserving of the same respect and reverence that we give to God the Father and to God the Son. He is not to be disregarded or kind of pushed to the side or not looked at as important in a Christian's life. He is God, the Spirit, and the third person of the Godhead. Now listen to me. To forsake a dependence on the Holy Spirit is to forsake a dependence upon God. Hands down. And to forsake a dependence on the Holy Spirit is to believe that I can fulfill God's call upon my life apart from the Holy Spirit. Or to build the church. Same thing. Apart from the Holy Spirit. Now one verse that I do love about Calvary Chapel that, I, that Chuck Smith uh, has standed upon, and we, uh, you see it all the time. It's Zechariah 4, 6. This is not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It's, it is our dependence upon the Holy Spirit that we as a church function. That's how we function. That's how we, we become alive. Now, theologically, I mean, come on, we know that to forsake the dependence of the Holy Spirit is completely, that's false theology. You know, you've got to depend on it, right? Because, the, you know, theologically, we know the Bible teaches us the importance of the Holy Spirit and our dependence on Him. Just as we'll see how the church of Sardis understood theologically the same. They weren't deprived of that information. They knew. But listen, it's possible to believe everything correctly about the Holy Spirit, but not live it practically in our lives, as we will see. Jesus lived it out in his life during his public ministry, but even Jesus could not fulfill his public ministry apart from the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So then how can anyone individually or as a church think we can live or accomplish what God has called us to do apart from the Holy Spirit? This right here 
brothers and sisters, is what Jesus is addressing to the church at Sardis. They cease to depend on the person of the Holy Spirit. And the problem with this, as we will see, is that it is possible to grow and an active and energetic church. It's possible based upon talent, you know, based upon cleverness, based upon human ability, or with a business degree. Hey, I've been educated. I know how to build something. As opposed to a dependence upon the work of the Holy Spirit. So yeah, there are ways to build a church apart from the Holy Spirit. Now, I know there's those within our community, not this community, I'm just talking about there, who think that they can do it better. You know, hey, I've been to approach and say, hey, what's your blueprint? I'm like, what are you talking about, a blueprint? I don't have a blueprint. Well, have you ever thought about getting a building? Well, of course, but we're trusting in God. Well, how about this kind of a business uh, avenue where you, you know, maybe uh, invest in a child care, but then, you know, so you get revenue coming in, you get a building, and, and I'm just like, bro, th- those things, that's up to the Lord. I'm not here to sit there and, and plan for him. He's got it already planned out, right? So there, there's a lot of things that people, you know, think that they can do things better, you know, but I don't care. <laughs> we're, we're doing it God's way, and we are doing this according to his plan, his timing, by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, look, I've been to many churches. I've seen how they've done things. I understand all their ways and how they operate it. I get it. However, that does not mean that is how God will do things here in this church. This is all leading, and he is working uniquely right as we are. I love that word, uniquely. (laughs) But now just, and here's the point. Here's my point to that word, just a side story. I remember when I was first called into the ministry, I showed up at Calvary Chapel Long Hollow thinking, okay, this is ministry. And God called me to his ministry, and he moved us here to Tennessee. So I was like, okay, let's go in and do ministry. Problem was, I thought their ministry at that church was ministry. Ministry was what I was called to do. All right, so I thought it was all the same. Ministry is our ministry as together collectively. And I'm like, well, kind of. I had to learn that what God had in store for me in ministry was different than what the Lord was already doing in their ministry. You see what I'm saying? So I've come rolling in and I'm like, hey, you know, I've got all these great ideas, you know, but it's like, whoa, 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 you know, hey, this is, this is their, their ministry. You know, God had given me visions, right? And he prepared me in different ways, but it was never intended to be applied in that church that he was already working in. So I came up with many new ideas, you know, being clever, you know, to help the church. That, okay, this will be better. That was in my eyes. This will be better. Again, from my perspective, when I had to literally, the Lord was just like, hey, Slow your roll, you know, and see the work that I'm already accomplishing within this body of Christ. And it was amazing. And and also he wanted me, he goes, look, I want you to see what I'm accomplishing in this ministry that I've called this pastor to. So I had to understand and see things through his eyes. I didn't need to make things better. I didn't need to help God, you know, because he was working uniquely in that church. And then he would call me, right, to plant and to teach. (laughs) That was a curveball. Thank you, Lord. (laughs) But I learned that the work of the Holy Spirit is unique. And the leading of the Holy Spirit is what is important and valuable. Calvary Chapel Long Hollow over there in, in Gillisville is a sweet fellowship. And the Holy Spirit is leading that church uniquely with that body. Just as he is leading us uniquely in this body. And although we are both Calvary chapels, we are different in many ways. And it is by the leading and the work of the Holy Spirit that he is doing these great things within his body, and it keeps us all unified under Jesus, the head of the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. So that's a, it's a good thing. He's leading us uniquely. And... Uh, We're all unified. So that is what makes us unique, is our dependency upon the leading of the Holy Spirit. Apart from him, we 
we would just be another church, in my opinion. You know, trying to do things that we're very accustomed of doing in our own minds from, from the different backgrounds that we've all came from. We'd be like, oh, hey, but we did this. Hey, well, the church needs to have this. We define it this way. So when you think about it, you know, we're, we're doing things by the direction of the Lord. You know, we all have ideas, you know, but we know what makes people feel comfortable in church. We just know that. And I know, for, for me personally, I know that you all love the Lord and you love his word because you're still coming to a hotel for church. <laughs> but it would be very easy, as it happens in our present day, to hire the most talented people together and brainstorm and plan a new church plant where then you put a marketing plan together, you know, setting timelines to stage it all, Kind of like any real estate realtors, you know, you know what I'm talking about, staging it all, right? And then to, to ultimately bring it to the cameras, the lights, and boom, the action. The problem with this is that this will always lack the witness of the Holy Spirit to it. And without the witness of the Holy Spirit within the service, then there's no life in that service. And many Christians who are spirit-filled can walk into a church that is well put together and well organized and sense something is missing. And they understand that it is the absence of the witness of the Holy Spirit. The witness of the Holy Spirit is absolutely critical in the life of an individual person and the life in a church. So we have the Holy Spirit, uh, the Spirit of the Lord, who brings life. And notice back in Isaiah, we see, second, the spirit of wisdom. Wisdom meaning the ability to make right decisions and good decisions. So one way we know uh, the church has ceased its dependence upon the Holy Spirit is when they start making a lot of bad decisions. When you know the decisions that are being made clearly lack wisdom. We're talking one after another bad decision. So don't get me wrong. There, there is not one church in this world who doesn't make a bad decision from time to time. But what we're talking about is a pattern of one bad decision after another that is occurring. Where people will begin to question, man, what's up with the leadership here? Are they even seeking the Lord in, you know, over prayer in these decisions? Are, are they listening to God? Do they know how to listen to God? I mean... This will damage the church and their, and their confidence and their leadership. And there's only so much a church can take of this. So a dependency on the Holy Spirit is critical for his wisdom to guide us to the right decisions according to the Lord's will. Third, in verse 2, we see the spirit of understanding, meaning to have discernment, right? The ability to comprehend and examine the inner heart of an issue. Meaning you can see the thing, you know, a lot of times we see things from the surface, but then God will step in. He gives us this discernment, this understanding of the inner things that are hidden, that are entirely different. For example, do you remember the time when the Apostle Paul was walking through Philippi? And then there was this young girl that was following him around who was demon-possessed. She was shouting to the people, hey, listen to him, right? Listen to this man. He has the words of God the Most High. Think about that, a demon-possessed girl working as an evangelist for Paul when Paul didn't want her help. Now, at surface, we can look at that and say, well, you know, it doesn't seem harmful at all, you know. But God gave Paul the understanding of what he was dealing with, the discernment, right, that this was a demon-possessed girl. So Paul then, you know, he casts the demon out of her. Thing is, in any situation... The spirit of understanding will give us the discernment to see things, right? To understand them in a way where we can say, you know what? I know this looks right, but something's wrong here. You know, something is not right here. The Holy Spirit has removed my peace about this situation. So something is definitely wrong here. I need to ask and, and seek him through this. This is where the Holy Spirit gives you understanding and tells you, hey, I know, you know, this looks like one thing but I'm telling you, it's not what it looks like. Then he gives us the understanding of what it is. And this is what ceased in the church at Sardis. Now, fourth, we have the spirit of counsel, meaning the ability to advise or to plan a right course of action. And who better 
to give counsel than he who is the beginning and the end. Right? He sees the future already. He would be an, an amazing resource for counsel. And knowing, especially the times that we are in, in the history of mankind, who better than to seek counsel for his church, you know, in these last days than from God, right? Now, can you imagine what a church would look like that has ceased their dependency on the Holy Spirit, losing God's counsel for, let's say, maybe a week? Or how about a month? Or how about for a year? No God, no counsel from the Lord. I mean, as, you know, the more time passes, I see there's no longevity in it. Especially in a church, you know, trying to survive, you know, on man's wisdom rather than uh, the supernatural leading and counsel of God. Again, this is what was going on in the church at Sardis. Fifth, we have the spirit of might. Speaking that God provides us with uh, the power to do what he calls us to do. Now, apart from the Holy Spirit, the church may get a lot of activity, right? They might be energetic and going and going and going, but you will also get a lot of turnover because people are doing this in their own strengths, and which will lead to burnout. Has anybody ever experienced burnout? Yeah, okay. Like a high-volume restaurant, you know, when things are high in, in, you know, with energy that's fast-paced, there's service going on, food coming in, food coming out, people being seated, seated, you know, it's just an ongoing thing, right? It, but, you know, after, you know, after a certain amount of time, from doing this day after day after day, they get burned out. And therefore, in a high-volume restaurant, you will always hear that there is high turnover in employees, because people can't, they're like, no, i got to find something else to do. And then people, hey, <laughs> I'm ready to do this. And then, like, not long after, they're like, okay, I need to find something else to do. It's just a repetitive thing. The same thing can happen in a church. People will be involved in all this activity, yet they can still get burned out, doing it in their own strength. It is God who provides us with the might, the strength, through the Holy Spirit. Six, we have the spirit of knowledge where the Holy Spirit gives us the supernatural ability to know God and understand God personally and through experience. He gives us the ability when we sit in a church service and we hear God's word being spoken, and he gives us the ability to move that information 18 inches, you know, from here down to the heart, where we understand who he is, and when God says, hey, this is what it has to do with my relationship with you, right? Apart from that work of the Holy Spirit, we may have a great intellectual understanding of God, just a bunch of, you know, knowledge of God, but it will never work its way down deep into our hearts and our relationship with Him because that is a work of the Holy Spirit in a Christian's life that only He can do. And as a church, knowledge brings forth the testimony of the Holy Spirit within our lives, of the relationship the church has with God, being set apart for his use. So to be without the spirit of knowledge where people can grow deeper and deeper in their relationship with God is a devastating loss. And again, this is what we're looking at with the church at Sardis. And finally, the seventh, we have the spirit of the fear of the Lord. This is where the Holy Spirit provides within us through nurturing uh, this deep respect and deep submission to God, which is to keep a deep personal holiness in our own lives. And not only that, it produces a deep awe and reverence that we feel towards God. And without the Holy Spirit producing the fear of the Lord within a person's life or a church, they drift further and further away from what is to be Christ-centered becoming more and more man-centered, becoming self-sufficient, becoming proud, becoming unholy. Now, after going through the seven spirits of the Holy Spirit of God, which grouped together in seven is the perfect fullness of the Holy Spirit, you have to ask the question, what church in its right mind, including us, could ever cut themselves off from all of that and still continue to survive? How could they survive? Again, this is what Jesus is driving at to the church. You may give the appearance of life, 
But without the seven spirits of the Holy Spirit being manifested in your life and in the church, that church is really dead. But Jesus gives us hope to a situation like this. He says, he says, I know your works. Like, I see all that you're doing. I know how you're doing them. I see it all. He says that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. And here's his exhortation in verse 2. He says, be watchful. In other words, wake up. Wake up. You've fallen asleep. You are to be alert of the fact that this is the condition you're in. And you, and you need to face this truth of it. He goes, and strengthen the things which remain. Meaning, whatever it is that remains in me within this church or within your life, do not let anything else spread to those things, those areas that are ready to die. In other words, they're, it's just a matter of time. They're ready to die. So he's like, change course. Reverse that spread. And here's why. Jesus says, for I have not found your works perfect before God. So everything within that church was ready for action every Sunday. But all that they were doing didn't measure up to God's standard because the presence of works is not enough. When God requires our works to have a particular purpose, there's a will. There's God's will in all this, right? And there's an intent for them. They should always be done, number one, for His glory and by the leading of the Holy Spirit to accomplish what God is calling this church to be. And the church lost sight of this. So Jesus reminds them, and he says in verse 3, remember. Circle that word remember in your Bibles. Remember. Therefore, how. Circle how in your Bibles. Those two words. Remember how. It says, remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Jesus is calling this church to remember that time when things were fresh and different. There was a time in their history that they were dependent upon the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus says remember, it means a time to go back to and recall, which tells us this is something that they once had. So this wasn't something, again, like, oh, we didn't know anything about that. What do you mean, the, the leading of the Holy Spirit? No, they had a past. They knew this. He wants them to remember, and this is important, how you have received and heard. It's not what you have received and referred. He says, how? This is not about doctrine, like Thyatira. The church is not dead because they forgot what they received. The church was dead because they forgot how they received and heard it with an absolute dependence of the Holy Spirit. When they didn't have the answers or, or you know, they knew all that they would be, they, had, they didn't have any of that stuff as a church. It was all under the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's why I tell you guys, you know, what, what's the blueprint? I don't know. Why? Because we're being led by the Holy Spirit. This is how we're functioning. This is what Jesus goes, remember back to that time. Because they're, they're, you know, they were who they were in the Holy Spirit. They represented God through the Holy Spirit. They understood they couldn't do anything apart from the Holy Spirit because God was with them and in them and upon them. And through the Holy Spirit, they had the wisdom, not of their own, they had understanding to discern what they couldn't see. They had counsel to guide them to make the right decisions. They had might to be able to do what it is that God has called them to do. They had the knowledge to go deeper in the relationship with the Lord. And they had the fear, the reverence for the Lord to live a surrendered life to Christ. Yet over time, it became so easy with their own wisdom, using their own methods, and it slowly crowded out the way they had done it in the days when they first received and heard. These days, those days, our days right now, are something that should never move out of our lives. The day that we received Christ, that, that time should never move out of our lives. Again, we need to fall back in love with Jesus. There was a, it was a great time in our life, and it still is today. I'm, we're walking it right now where we understand that we can do nothing apart from the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, hold fast. I mean, in other words, hold firm to those things. And then he says, and repent. Jesus had to remind them and is calling Sardis back to the same kind of dependence on the Holy Spirit as they did in their early days. Now, listen, um, churches are only 
truly alive to the degree that they are empowered and led by the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. Churches are only truly alive to the degree that they are empowered and led by the Holy Spirit. And that's the same for us as Christians. We are only truly alive to the degree, to the degree that we are empowered and led by the Holy Spirit. It starts with us every morning of every day, daily. In other words, in order for us to live this supernatural Christian life, there's a death that has to occur every morning. And that death is our old self. It's who we used to be. And when we recognize ourselves to be dead but alive in Christ, then the resurrected Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit flows out of our lives. He's in control. You know, you see that picture, you know, where you, you got someone who's alive and boom, there's Christ, but then boom, boom, someone else comes up. That's the same thing. If we resurrect our own person, our old self, our old nature, then that's who's going to be front and center. You have to reckon that person dead and then allow Christ, boom, to come up. Isn't that, isn't that goofy how I just did that? I'm so <laughs> thankful you guys have mercy on me. But now Jesus... He gives a clear warning to the church that if his counsel is ignored, he's, he's about to take action. He says in verse 3, Therefore, if you will not watch, if you'll not be awake, right, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. So Jesus would come unexpectedly and suddenly to deal with them in judgment. If they continued in their dead condition after receiving this warning, but Jesus then points out, it's pretty unique, a remnant that was in that church, which tells us anytime you have a church that is not led by the power of the Holy Spirit, carnality will make its way in, right? Complacency will make its way into the church. Compromise will start to make its way into the church, and it becomes normal within the church, right? And apparently that was what's happening here as well. And there were those who remained faithful to God's word. I love the remnant. Praise God, right? There was a group that remained faithful, and Jesus commends them and promises the remnant a close intimacy in their relationship with him. It's as simple as how Jesus says it in John chapter 14, verse 23. He says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. That is the most wonderful, wonderful thing, a word to take uh, from Jesus. Jesus says to those who are faithful, verse 4, he says, there's, you know, like you have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So he makes this promise to them for their faithfulness, and obedience to him in the face of this difficult church that he will take their relationship deep, deeper as they walk with him. He gives them, he gives them that promise when he says they will walk with me in white. That's his righteousness. That's his righteousness. Then he gives the promise to the overcomers and says, verse 5, he who overcomes, and these are those who understand and heed his words, saying, hey, you know, we need to repent and get back to our, our first things. He says, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, meaning righteousness, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, giving absolute assurance of salvation. And look, here we see Jesus speaking of how our names are written in the book of life. So yes, for those who have believed and received Jesus as Lord, there is a book in heaven with your name written in it. Jesus talks about it right here. There is that book. And then he declares, and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And again, for those two who overcome. And then Jesus closes his letter as he does all letters. Verse 6, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. That means it's still, he's still saying to the churches. If a church is not being led by the Holy Spirit and is not dependent upon the Holy Spirit, that church is not alive. If a Christian is not being led by the Holy Spirit or is not dependent upon the Holy Spirit, 
that Christian is not alive. It is only through the Holy Spirit of Christ and all the seven spirits of the Holy Spirit that we are alive supernaturally in Him. Okay? This morning, let us embrace this warning. And may the Holy Spirit search our hearts and bring forth the truth of His Word and reveal to us how He sees our lives. And if He tells you, hey, look, I want you to remember. I want you to go back and do those things that you did at first when you were at this wonderful high uh, level with me, where you were just dependent on me. Go back and do those things. Go back to a complete dependency of the Holy Spirit. And he says to those, and if you have been faithful in the face of a difficult world, in the face of difficult situations, you, you just held fast to him, ask the Lord to take you into a deeper intimacy in your relationship with him through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may today, this day, be a day of refreshment in our walks with the Lord, and may it be a day of refreshment as a church. Amen? Let us pray. Lord, we thank you.